Yeah, they gave they gave him like like all sorts of raw materials and stuff. Yeah, so he's gonna attack them now. It's because he he doesn't like that situation. I know, I, I know. Okay. November 23rd, 1940. Germany, Italy, and Japan signed the Tripartite Pact two months ago, creating the Axis powers. This week, more nations joined them. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the British successfully attacked Italian ships at port in the Battle of Taranto, an attack which gave inspiration to the Japanese. The Italian Air Force was also having problems over Britain while the Italian army was being pushed back by the Greeks. I talked last week about Hitler's plans for the Soviet Union invasion. British intelligence has become more and more aware of those plans. By mid-November, they know that Germany plans to motorize a third of their divisions, is increasing paratroop divisions, and plans to increase the divisions in Romania to 18. They do not need 18 divisions to train the Romanian army or guard the oil fields. Other intel services have their eyes open as well. This week on the 18th, Richard Sorges, Stalin's German spy in Tokyo, begins sending messages to Moscow that Germany is making preparations for some sort of an Eastern Front. The German economy is not as strong as people outside of Germany think. It's only a bit larger than Britain's, and the British have a higher per capita income. And it can't run on a wartime basis indefinitely with millions of soldiers to take care of. Hitler is well aware of this, and indeed, economic arguments are a part of his desire to attack the Soviet Union. Yes, he does want to eradicate Bolshevism. Yes, he does now want to get rid of any Soviet threat before finishing off Britain. But there is something big economically at play here. The Soviets delivered to Germany an enormous quantity of resources after they signed their pact last year. In 1940, numbers courtesy of Max Hastings, the USSR provides most of Germany's animal feed products, 74% of its phosphorus, 67% of its asbestos, 65 of chrome ore, 55 of manganese, 40 of nickel, and 34% of the oil. A third of Germany's oil this year came from the USSR. All of this convinced Hitler that such a level of dependence was intolerable. That summer, a poor German harvest made necessary the import of huge quantities of Ukrainian wheat. He became impatient to appropriate the Soviet Union's corn belt and thirsty for the oil of the Caucasus. But you know, the eyes of the world are still focused on Germany and Britain and the Blitz. So even as Hitler's generals are making plans for the East, and even as intel about those plans is starting to filter to the rest of the world, it's often ignored. This month, British intelligence in Helsinki get a report from an Estonian double agent who has been told by a German officer that they are preparing a 1940 campaign against the USSR. The British intelligence officer dismisses the report. It's not gonna happen. Speaking of the Blitz, though, there are some changes in British High Command directly related to it. I've talked before about the growing movement in Britain to have Hugh Dowding, head of British Fighter Command, and Keith Park, the head of Eleven Group, the region responsible for the defense of London and the Southeast, removed from office. As we've seen, it is Trafford Lee Mallory, commander of Twelve Group, and Air Marshal Sholto Douglas that lead the opposition. I spoke about the big wing controversy a few weeks ago, but there's also a controversy over night interception. Doubting is working on a means where a pilot could rely entirely on instruments and radar. A paper he had written on it certainly caught Churchill's approval, but a lot of people thought it impossible, Sholto Douglas among them. Another critic is Sir John Salmond, who chairs a committee on night defense. Doubting got Salmond's committee report and disregarded it. According to James Holland, when Dowding saw Salmon's report of 18 points, he crossed out nine of them and put question marks by another five. In being this dismissive, he had made a mistake, for it was Lord Beaverbrook who had set up the committee in the first place. Beaverbrook is the Minister of Aircraft Production, and those two words are pretty key for Britain's efforts in the Battle of Britain. Beaverbrook sees that night fighters are the key to future aerial defense. And in spite of the respect he has for Doubting and what Doubting has achieved, he feels 
unfairly, that doubting does not treat the matter with the urgency it requires. It was precisely the dismissive reaction Beaverbrook had expected, but now gave him the leverage needed to ease doubting from office. Doubting had thought that after Churchill's open backing in the summer, his position was pretty much impregnable. This was a big miscalculation because it was not. Well, this week on the 19th, pilot John Cunningham, who will earn the nickname Cat's Eyes Cunningham for his skill at night fighting, shoots down a Junkers Ju-88 using airborne radar basically doing what Dowding thinks is what they should be doing, thus proving Salmon, Douglas, Beaverbrook, and company wrong. But it is too late. Dowding and Keith Park will be removed from office two days from now, the 25th, and their jobs will be taken by Sholto Douglas and Trafford Lee Mallory. Interestingly enough, there's another radar development this week. A German U-boat approaching a shipping convoy is picked up by a Sunderland flying boat equipped with an air-to-surface radar set. This is the first time in actual operations airborne radar has made such a location. But beyond the war in the skies and beyond the war at sea, there is war on land this week. The Greek counteroffensive against the Italians continues, and by the 19th, the Italians are pushed from Greek soil. On the 22nd, the Greeks take Koritza, 15 miles across the Albanian border. They also take 2,000 Italians, 135 artillery pieces, and 600 machine guns. Greek Prime Minister and authoritarian strongman Ioannis Metaxas then tells the Greek people they are fighting for other Balkan peoples and for Albania's liberation as well. Adolf Hitler, tells Italian Foreign Minister Count Ciano of his dissatisfaction with the Italian campaign in Greece. He says it is necessary for Germany to intervene to prevent Britain from being in a position to attack the Romanian oil fields. But Hitler does not think he can do this before mid-March. Thing is, though Britain has now sent men and planes to its Greek ally, Metaxas is not giving the British any long-range bases from which they might make such an attack. He does not want to provoke Nazi Germany. He's pretty certain his army can deal with the Italians, but not the Wehrmacht. Hitler also talks with Ramon Serrano Suner, Spanish foreign minister, about the need to close the Mediterranean, to isolate the British in Egypt or Malta, and to do that, they must attack Gibraltar. Suner tells Hitler that Spain requires 400,000 tons of grain before they will declare war on Britain. Hitler sees this for what it is, a delaying tactic and a means to avoid commitment. But he is getting other commitments elsewhere. On the 20th, Hungary signs the Tripartite Pact, joining the Axis powers. Romania also does the 23rd. Tomorrow, the 24th, the German puppet state Slovakia will follow suit. On the 25th, the USSR states its terms to sign the pact as well. These include territorial gains in Europe, but do make economic offerings. Adolf Hitler, however, has no intention of allowing the Soviets to join the pact under any circumstances, and he plans to attack the USSR in the spring. He has this to say. Political conversations designed to clarify the attitude of Russia in the immediate future have been started. Regardless of the outcome of these conversations, all preparations for the East, previously ordered orally, are to be continued. Written directives on that will follow as soon as the basic elements of the Army's plan for the operation have been submitted to me and approved by me. In fact, Soviet terms include the withdrawal of German troops from Finland and allowing the USSR military bases in Bulgaria. Hitler will order German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop to make no reply. But what of the other Axis power, Japan, far to the east? Well. The Chinese 5th Army has detected a buildup of Japanese forces by now in Hubei province and is preparing defenses. At the end of the week, the Japanese 11th Army under Weishiro Sonobe is now in position for an attack they call the Han River Operation. We'll see how that goes next week. For now, this week ends with new Axis powers, continuing headaches for the Italian Army, German economic concerns, and a shakeup in British aviation leadership. You know, also in mid-November, Hugh Dowding forwards a report written by Keith Park to the Air Ministry which details the fighting of the past two months. What it shows is that the failure of the Luftwaffe to destroy or neutralize fighter command prevented any sort of quick or easy end to the war in the West. That's a big deal because German air power 
is by no means the only threat facing Britain. The war against Italy and North Africa, and now peripherally in Greece, is a big deal too. Britain has to have a major naval campaign in the Mediterranean as well. At just the time when they could use that naval power in their home, or in the Battle of the Atlantic to protect their trade routes, on which the British Empire relies for survival. All of this illustrates how fragile Britain's position was in 1940, fighting two European great powers, her navy under constant submarine threat, the economy in crisis, a predatory Japan in Eastern Asia, waiting for Britain's star to fall like France before her. In the end, only a small proportion of the war effort of Britain and the Commonwealth was exerted against the German Air Force in the autumn war in the air. But who did that immediately affect? It was the children and the elderly, actually, who took the Blitz the hardest. The children, uncomprehending. And the elderly, well, in all hell let loose, Max Hastings quotes American correspondent Ernie Pyle, who will write a couple of months from now. It was the old people who seemed so tragic. Think of yourself at 70 or 80, full of pain, and the dim memories of a lifetime that has probably been all bleak. And then think of yourself now, traveling at dusk every night to a subway station, wrapping your ragged overcoat around your old shoulders, sitting on a wooden bench with your back against the curved street wall, sitting there all night in nodding and fitful sleep. Think of that as your destiny every night, every night from now on. If you'd like to know more about another Greek conflict with a neighbor, check out our Between Two Wars episode about the Greco-Turkish War right here. Our patron of the week is Pace Lowry. Thanks to Pace's support and that of others, we keep everything rolling here. So be like Pace and support us at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. Every dollar really does count. Share, subscribe, click the bell. See you next time. Mm -hmm.